Hey there, everyone. Today we're going to be looking at the third chapter of Shannon Bell's Fast Feminism. This one titled The Perverse Aesthetic of a Child Pornographer, John Robert Sharp. And in this chapter, Bell is going to be arguing for literary and artistic merit of transgressive literature through the case of John Robert Sharp, who on April 10th of 1995 was charged with two accounts of possession of written and visual child pornography and two counts of possession of that same child pornography for the purpose of distribution. Now, he had been arrested under a new law in Canada's criminal code that went into existence in 1993 regarding child pornography and you know whether or not this constituted significant harm. So in this chapter, Bell is going to be looking at the court proceedings, which she was present for, and looking at the various defenses of John Robin Sharp to look at what classifies something as having literary merit, especially in transgressive literature, the likes of the Marquis de Sade or William Burroughs. Now, in terms of adding the child pornography law, this was added on to the existing obscenity laws, and this is in section 163.1 of Canada's criminal code. And as Bell mentions in her footnote, the law of obscenity following Butler is based on preventing harm, particularly harm towards women. Determining whether material is obscene became based on the classification of pornography into three categories. First, representations of explicit sex with violence, which would almost always be found to be obscene. Second, representations of explicit sex without violence that are degrading and dehumanizing. These would be obscene if the risk of harm is substantial. And third, representations of explicit sex without violence that are not degrading and dehumanizing and do not involve children in their production. These generally are not found to be obscene. Now, all of these are subject to community standards tests, which are basically polls of Canadians in order to figure out if the material is perceived by public opinion to be harmful to society, particularly to women. And the question of degradation, of course, is rather subjective, so they go for a kind of democratic process here. And then the artistic merit defense is the final step if the material has passed the community standards and dehumanizing and degrading tests. And in this John Robert Sharp case, the artistic merit defense was upheld. So it was determined after all this, I know, spoiler, that this was in fact It had artistic merit, and particularly this was with regards to John Robert Sharp's book, which wasn't really published, Boy Abuse, and it's, you know, it's a piece of transgressive literature, just like William Burroughs or the Marquis de Sade, both of which are considered within the community of literary studies to have artistic merit. In fact, Marquis de Sade is one of my favorite authors, call me perverse or interesting, I don't know. But Bell, in this chapter, is making, maybe it's a controversial argument. She states it here on page 87. Most feminisms tend to equate sexualized writings and images of persons under 18 years old, and in the more lenient versions under 14 years old, as child sexual abuse. Fast feminism argues the possibility of ethical and cultural acceptability for written and visual representations of sexualized youth. And that's very interesting, you know, because literature has kind of existed for throughout human history, but, you know, and transgression has also been a part of that, of violating certain norms trying to reveal things about our current situation. Um, I think about Langland, for example, in a lot of Langland's writing. He's actively actively critiquing um, church practices and greed, for example, in like Piers Plowman. So all this literature that we regularly see as being the most brilliant is often 
transgressive. It's often political. Just some are more transgressive than others. So the question, of course, is where does that lie? Because even the most staunchly conservative person would admit that getting rid of all materials that could be viewed as transgressive or offensive, that would be the grossest violation of freedom of press, expression, and speech. You know, a lot of conservatives today are like, well, just because it makes you uncomfortable that I say this doesn't mean you need a safe space and all this. It's like, okay, there's clearly there's clearly a tolerance for transgression, but typically if it transgresses in a way that we're used to. And one of the arguments being made by Bell throughout this work is the importance of transgression that takes us to our limits, not necessarily past our limits, because, you know, that would, that would be where we're constituting real harm, but kind of mixing together a willingness or a consensual effort to undergo something potentially painful, whether that's physically painful or kind of mentally, spiritually painful, if we want to say that. The willingness to do this and society's ability to accept that and allow for a fluidity of identity. And of course, our notions of identity, you know, they only go so far. They do have limits. So the importance of especially transgressive literature is to take us to those limits. I Think of the Marquis de Sade, who's taking us to the very limits of the human mind, of what can be concocted and what orientations bodies can be placed in. But as hard as it may be to believe, Bell is genuinely trying to find a new respect and a new caringness for marginalized groups through transgressive literature, the likes of Marquis de Sade and indeed Sharp. She writes on page 88, It is not hard for most people to respond to the call of Levinas's widow, orphan, and stranger. They are the victims, the disasters, the powerless ones. It is far more difficult to respond to those pervert others who have been placed at the bottom of what Gail Rubin calls the erotic pyramid. Promiscuous homosexuals, fetishists, sadomasochists, those who engage in sex for money, and the lowest of all, those whose eroticism transgresses generational boundaries. And she continues that, as the author Jesse Baring points out, pedophile is an umbrella category for any person fantasizing about and or engaged in sexual encounters with anyone under 18, regardless of whether they are 7 years old, 12 years old, or 17 years old. So again, we're confronting um, this binary that features in a lot of talks about the age of consent, for example, and Foucault himself has gotten in hot water for being engaged in a famous letter that he wrote challenging the age of consent. More specifically, though, the age of consent being differential between hetero and homosexuals, and that's an interesting conversation to get into. But one of the points that continues to be berated here um, and she mentions this, for example, Justice Mary Sothen at the British Columbia Court of Appeal says to the Crown Counsel, at some point, are you going to explain how someone between the ages of 14 and 18 is a child? So, right, there's this legal category of child, which spans all the way to people up to 18, and then they instantly change from child to adult. And obviously, like, legal professionals are aware that that's not literally like something magical just happens physically to your body and you suddenly change from a child to an adult. No, that's just the limits of a binaristic logic of understanding consent. And it really reduces sex to a legal, illegal binarism across an arbitrary and sudden line that it is transgressive literature's object of desire, really, and purpose to creatively, artistically, and soberly contest. Now, the court specifies, and this is kind of a breath of fresh air coming from a U.S. political scene, which is um, very conservative right now and has been fairly conservative for, you know, at least the 70s. 
But the court privileged artistic merit over potential harm to society. They said that child pornography could be harmful and at the same time art. They specify, and this is on page 90, that artistic merit should be interpreted as including any expression that may reasonably be viewed as art. Any objectively established artistic value, however small, suffices to support the defense. Simply put, artists, so long as they are producing art, should not fear prosecution under section 163.1. And I think this is a really crucial part of the academic process that Bell is trying to uphold is the value of transgression in a controlled yet proliferous situation. Because one of the things about transgressive literature and one thing that's being questioned throughout is whether or not harm has merit. And Bell elaborates on this on page 91. What became extremely difficult to sustain for the Crown in applying the Supreme Court's interpretation of the artistic merit defense and for the Crown's two expert witnesses was the cognitive ability to separate harm from child pornography. They simply could not believe that artistic merit outweighs any harm in a genre that was deemed to be harmful by its very nature. Because the Crown and Crown experts could not separate the moral qualities of Mr. Sharp's work from the assessment of artistic merit, their arguments were discredited by Judge Shaw. In a sense, the Supreme Court's decision applies a very postmodern logic. A written work can be child pornography and as a result inherently harmful, and it can have artistic merit. So, Bell is trying to argue that there is merit and harm, that harm has merit, and especially in a controlled literary context, which has allusions and subtleties and literary devices and genre and relations to other writers. The question throughout this case was whether or not information equals advocacy whether or not the existence of the admittedly very shockingly violent and cruel acts in Mr. Sharp's work are equivalent with the advocacy of those acts. And this is an argument that features in the literary analyses of the Marquis de Sade as well, is if and when is the Marquis de Sade advocating for what he writes about? And especially with transgressive literature, especially for like the Marquis de Sade, there's so much illusions going on and so much subtleties precisely because of the problems with getting this literature published in the first place, such that we lose a little bit of the obviousness of the literary message that might have been present in medieval literature or, you know, classical literature. And instead, we have a little bit of a blurring the lines between the presence of information and the literal intent of that information. And this is part of literature, is that it pushes these boundaries between real and figurative, between overt statements and the meaning of those overt statements. And really the problem for, for example, the prosecution is that transgressive literature was seen as fundamentally advocating everything that is transgressed in the literature, which is not necessarily something that is in the consensus in the literary studies community. And in this chapter... Bell mentions not only her own defense that she delivered for Mr. Sharp's work, but also the work of two other scholars who use hermeneutics and uh, postmodern literary criticism in order to situate this as a work of literary quality and subtlety. And as it's mentioned 
in an anonymous review in Broken Pencil, which is a Canadian literary magazine. The book is a straightforward third-person narrative written more like an ethnographic study than a fiction. So the very fact of genre, of the way transgressive literature is written, tells us a lot about is this serious? Is this a tongue-in-cheek caricature or a satire? What are we to make of this? And of course, there's not necessarily a 100% objective answer. Hermeneutics, of course, tries to do this and tries to get to a very objective understanding of literature's meaning. And really it amounts to, you know, a web of relations in which we can figure out, okay, what is this relation in in its historical context, in terms of the genres it's alluding to, in terms of the events it's alluding to, in terms of the commonly agreed upon interpretations, and it's kind of as close as we can get to an objective reading. But as Bell mentions on page 93, Prosecution experts will never be able to see merit in writings like those of John Robert Sharp, because the only genre they have to contextualize the work is stereotypical child porn. For a reader like myself, schooled in the counter-psychoanalysis of Deleuze and Guattari, the literary sadism of the Marquis de Sade and Georges Bataille, and the ethics of the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, Sharp's works are masterpieces of sadistic compassion. Censorious readers believe that Sharp's intent was simply to create masturbatory materials per for perverts, but his writings draw on too many literary conventions to warrant this criticism. And this is alluding back to a point that she made earlier, which is that, you know, intolerance oftentimes is a matter of merely not being acclimated to something shocking. And then as a result, the existence of that shocking material is requisite for the necessary growth intellectually, literarily. And the fact that Sharp's work has so many literary conventions that it takes advantage of, which we'll see here in a second, it really can't just be reduced to material intended for masturbation, for example, for some sort of just pure physical sensation, instead of also serving a literary function. Because something can serve more than one function. It can serve as being interpretable as some way, while not being reduced to that method of interpretation. For example, I can, I can use a book as a paperweight, but that doesn't mean it's just a paperweight, obviously. And now we're getting into the question of what constitutes the legitimate or necessary meaning of literature at any one time. And I don't, I don't think that Bell or any of the scholars here are necessarily trying to point to some objective reason, but they are trying to get rid of this reductive reading of legal experts to literature that just happens to be outside of their place of comfortability. And one of the interesting things about Sharp's work that Bell points out is that in contrast to the Marquis de Sade, this work focuses on, as she says, children as masters of their own bodies and souls. They are not Oedipalized. Oedipus informs us, if you don't follow the lines of differentiation, mommy, daddy, me, you will fall into the black night of the undifferentiated. And that's a quote from Anti-Oedipus. However, the pervert, the pervert resists Oedipalization. He has invented other territorialities to operate in. De Beauvoir's observation of Sade was that he attached greater importance to the stories he wove around the act of pleasure than to the actual contingent happenings. He chose the imaginary. Her analysis applies equally well to Sharp. However, Sharp's libertine turn towards his beliefs, opinions, thoughts, and conscience was articulated with a libertarian political strategy that demands freedom of expression and particularly the right to concretize and possess in tangible form the immateriality of one's own thoughts and fantasies. <laughs> 
And that's a really important element for understanding the literary value of transgressive literature is tangibly owning the immateriality of one's thoughts and fantasies, of having a handle on one's mind and the possibilities of imagination by taking one to one's limits. And of course, Sharp's work does focus a lot on self-ownership, on a sort of equanimity of tribes, for example, who engage in um, various coming-of-age rituals, um, one of which being circumcision occurring around the ages of 12. And this is based on actual occurrings in various tribes. For example, one of Sharp's short texts in Boy Abuse, the text of concern for this trial, was about a tribe off the island of Borneo, I think, which is in the Philippines. So this is actual stuff going on, and it reminds me, for example, of Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, which gives us a sober look into, okay, yeah, maybe this stuff might make you uncomfortable, but people actually do this, and these rituals of violence and transgression and you know, trading of people, for example, in Things Fall Apart, can serve some social function which may make us uncomfortable. And it's not necessarily an advocacy of that practice to learn about that practice, but it does teach us something about human psychology. Bell continues here on page 95, In Sad's 120 Days of Sodom, Sophie uttered a piercing scream as she emerged from the closet. In the tradition of Bataille, Sharp attempts to narrate the scream of the human exposed to pain. He is concerned with the moment the self is torn open and exposed to what is other to it. It is here that the boundary between the self and other liquefies. Sharp delivers the feelings of those who remain speechless and thus are merely victims in Sad's imaginary world. For Sad, there is no other as autonomous being, there is only the sovereign man. In Sharp's writing, the sovereign man comes apart when his partners in crime are boys with wills of their own. Sharp writes the scream as a combination of the will to laughter, those moments that make one gasp, and moments when the ceaseless operation of cognition is dissolved. So the risks that Sharp takes in his writings are very different insofar as for Sud, it is a pure question of being in full submission through pain in an involuntary manner. But in Sharp's manner, he's looking especially at these practices of various tribes, for example, where one can at least argue that it is willing in a sense. And one, one could also equally argue, and I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to it, that the love of pain may be a form of Stockholm Syndrome. But of course, that calls into question whether or not Stockholm Syndrome is just a way of explaining our affinity for pain after we go through it and the way it makes us grow as people. Now, of course, the problem with that is you can say that, but then you will meet people who have Stockholm Syndrome and are in abusive situations. So one of the literary benefits and social benefits of putting it into literature is you put it in a controlled environment where you give a voice to, for example, children experiencing sexual abuse, sexual encounters, whatever term, you know, whatever adjective we want to use to describe this. Nevertheless, it is the case that a voice is being given that has traditionally not been given. And as such, we really start to see the potential for interpreting this as a question of personal growth through the experience of traditionally unacceptable forms of communication and action. Bell mentions on page 96, Rupert, a fictionalized version of Robert Sharp, is one of the most sensitive, spiritual, passionate, and ethical boys in literature. Rupert struggles with his desire for his friends, Quote, I wanted to tell him no, and I wanted him to jack me. 
and with his own correct code of ethics derived from religious beliefs enacted in devout, innocent, desolate religious practices. I suspect what has prohibited the publication of Rupert Unexcurbated is the Bataillon worship scene quoted above in which Rupert's blood is mixed with God's energy. For Bataille, God is a horror. For Sharp, the most sacred being is a little boy. And that quote she mentioned, I, I won't mention it in too much detail, but basically Rupert has been taught about the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and the boy starts to have this obsession with crucifixion and with the sort of ecstasy that you know Christ's sacrifice has given for people who can go to heaven. And he's like, well, I wonder what that ecstasy would be like for me. And, of course, eventually he finds nails and he puts the nails into his wrists, as it's said that Jesus did, and he's rubbing the blood on his body like Jesus would have when he was stabbed and as the blood is coming out of his wrists. And for just a small portion of this, I quote, I looked at myself and my Jesus picture and then I smeared it all over me. It was like I was right there with him, just the two of us, Jesus and me. My peony was aching, and I remembered they'd done something to him down there, so I smeared blood on it. Oh, it was the type of feeling you get when you're baptized. And this very much links up with Bataille, with this ecstatic unity that comes via extreme sensations, which we also see in the psychological-slash-philosophical understanding of pain in the Marquis de Sade's work, where for Sade, pain is something that can induce pleasure because it induces a sensation which is extreme, and sensations in and of themselves can deliver pleasure, and Sade says that pain excites one's sensations in terms of a more significant sensation than pleasure does, and that as such, it can deliver a more significant ecstatic unity. So this is very similar to these Bataillon themes that Bell mentions, where there's this mix between the divine as something far off and the feeling of the divine through acts of transgression. And as such, I think it's very reasonable to assume that this scene does have very significant literary value insofar as just like sad is considered you know a classic of literature of french literature of kind of proto early modern literature in a sense that there is something going on here that needs to be retained and i like this quote that's mentioned from art critic cobaina mercer who says that in addition to being sexually explicit the perverse aesthetic manifests in a textual ambivalence that ensures the uncertainty of any singular meaning. And that uncertainty is really important because it reflects part of the human condition, in fact. And through that uncertainty of what role does pain play in our lives, because, you know, we don't like pain, but also many painful experiences, whether this is emotionally or physically, often serve as some of the most important moments for growth for people. And as such, that ambivalence being delivered through literature as a controlled medium, once again, is a reason to respect it at the very least. As an additional defense regarding Sharp's work, Bell writes here on page 100, taking someone beyond their limit is prohibited. This is an explicit post-contemporary sadomasochist rule. Quote, those who abuse the boys beyond their limits are not welcome back, end quote. However, if you want a boy's respect, you must, quote, push him to his limits. So this is not an advocacy for pedophilia or harmful acts objectively and in itself. You, you know, you could argue that anything is advocating for something. But once again, the specific and abundant use of literary mechanisms makes it difficult to just reduce it to, you know, truth value of, yes, this is advocacy.
Rather, it opens up a literary window into the human self or into the soul, if you want to use such a term. And by doing that, it gives us access to a register of sexual control and agency that seems all the more powerful by acting in these painful situations. Because when you read some of Sharp's work, you see the profound power that comes from someone in a traditionally exploited situation having sexual power to run the show. And as is quoted here, those who have been through the entire process, the cutlings, form a council who make the rules and rule on exceptions. So once again, the control and the limits are in the hands of those in a less fortunate position. As Bell writes here on page 104, Sharp's respect and love for his semi-fictional characters recuperates their lives. He is able to show the agency of the so-called victims and their joy of life, even in the direst material circumstances. So for Bell, the perverse is ultimately about the existence and henceforth contestation of the category of victim. Of how can one relate to the victim by understanding and witnessing and being a part of their struggles. And I see no better medium with which to experience the victim's struggles than through literature. Now, it would be terribly time-consuming and not very beneficial for me to summarize this second part of the chapter, but it looks at the testimonies of two defense witnesses. One is an English professor, James Miller, from the University of Western Ontario, and Lorraine Wire from the University of British Columbia. And Miller's testimony is particularly important because he goes through extreme details to show how Boy Abuse and Stand by America 1953, this was the other work that was considered of Sharp's work as the main focus that was being prosecuted, to show that these are parodies, that these are caricatures. As Miller says, transgressive literature is deeply satiric in its design and often uses shocking imagery. So, you know, libertine novels, they live off turning norms themselves into caricatures and ambivalent objects. Even in the, for example, the characters of the Marquis de Sade's work, I think of Justine, or Therese, as her name is, you know, hidden throughout the work. Spoiler alert, I guess. When you look at her character, it is this taken to the extreme religious virtue, piety, faithfulness, unwavering love of virtue. And obviously, it's just a complete caricature. Like, he clearly wants us to almost laugh at her through the sufferings that she goes through because she's just so unwilling to grow. And part of Justine that makes it so interesting is that Therese is forced to grow through undergoing such extreme circumstances. She's forced to become more pragmatic, more aware of her identity, more aware of you know the role of seduction, pain, and pleasure. And by doing all this, the reader can't help but grow with them. So transgressive literature at its very core is a question of personal growth, which is extremely pers- pertinent to Bell's philosophy of a whole, as a whole, which is focused on going to these extremes, whether it's with you know female ejaculation, for example, or transgressive literature, to find those limits and test them. It's not to, you know, it's not meant to be fatalistic. It's meant to be life-affirming, but through taking life to its limits, quite like the post-human art of Stellark. Miller explains by looking at one of the stories in particular, the rites of Port Derlon, parts one, two, and three, which were particularly contentious for this trial, that it takes an ethnographic perspective in which one is writing about a people, its rights, economies, social kinship structures, marriage ceremonies, and sexual mores. And this is a literary genre that you can see uncovered in 
Edward Said's Orientalism, for example, where he looks at these ethnographic understandings of, quote unquote, the Orient, and, you know, looking at how it takes a supposedly objective perspective and inserts a number of stereotypes and presuppositions that taint our understanding of the other. But one of the things that's pointed out is that Sharp's literature forces us to encounter that other. It forces us to go all the way. It forces us to not have the sort of separation that we might see in some of the works that Edward Said looks at, and instead forces us to get rid of a scientific distance and actively participate with the other. And I think this is one of the most important qualities that Miller is able to point out in the themes of Mr. Sharp's writings. And he says that it's familiar to readers of sacred literature, such as Milton's Samson Agonistes. The spiritual virtue of fortitude becomes primarily visible in the physical endurance of the beaten and whipped boys. Miller concludes that Sharp's stories are designed to provoke a controversial response at least to unsettle fixed or traditional understandings of the virtues and the vices. And Miller mentions in his analysis how this is visible not only in the work of Milton, but in the work of Dante, for example, in the Inferno. How we go through people's sufferings quite literally, just like Dante does in the story through the aid of Virgil. Now, in that case, it's kind of the one of the earliest instantiations of this transgressive literature, and we still have this sort of omniscient narrator of Virgil who, you know, guides us seamlessly and tells us, you know, these are all the bad things that are going to happen to you. And it's not quite as ambiguous as the work of Saad, for example, but nevertheless, we are forced to endure things we haven't had to endure before. And when we put it in that context and in that manner, it seems that literature is one of the safest and most responsible ways to undergo such a change. As he continues, it recounts in endless variations the possibilities for sexual torment far beyond what one would suspect is actually practiced by the majority of its readers. It is an imaginative literature rather than a journalistic report of criminal acts. And as he mentions, it takes place in an imaginary Gothic space of a remote chateau. So it is purposely imaginative and extreme, well beyond what one would actually expect, precisely to subvert expectations and establish norms of virtues and vice. And as such, I think this chapter does make quite a good case for the need for transgression and for transgressive literature that can have artistic merit. And this doesn't mean that every form of transgression has artistic merit, of course. they If you read the book, you'll see in detail the actual artistic merit that is in place in Sharp's work. And I'll link in the description Sharp's website where you can actually read all of his works, including Boy Abuse, if you'd like, and see kind of what they're talking about, see if you agree or disagree. But I think this is a good summary of what's been going on in this chapter. It would be beneficial to read to get some of the subtleties, um, particularly if you just think I'm crazy and can't at all see the point that Bell is making. It's certainly probably a bit of a question of personal taste to an extent, so like, no worries. But I hope this has been of use in understanding some of Shannon Bell's work. Check out some of the lectures I've done on the rest of this work and other postmodernists, German idealists, gender theorists, and other writers. Join the channel for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a monthly private philosophy Zoom that you can tailor to your needs. Maybe you want to talk about some thinker. Maybe you need help on some text. Maybe I can shed some light. Maybe we can just brainstorm together. That's it, and I'll see you in another video.